Hello, welcome to I See Myself, Diversity in Children's Literature, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. If you haven't read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our, our bookseller for this event, please visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. We appreciate our partner for this event, the Kluge Roo Abor Aboriginal Art Collection of UVA. With support from the Australia, Australia Council for the Arts, the UVA Mellon Indigenous Arts Initiative, and the UVA Vice Provost for the Arts. Also, we appreciate the help of our community partners in sharing this event with the public. Thank you. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Angela Dominguez, author of Stella Diaz Dreams Big, was born in Mexico City and grew up in the great state of Texas. She now resides in Virginia. Angela is the author and illustrator of several books for children and a two-time recipient of the Puro Belpre illustration honor. Welcome, Angela. Vashti Harrison is the New York Times bestselling creator of Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World, and Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History. She is also the illustrator of Lupita Nyong'o's Sulwe and Cherry, Matthew Cherry's Hair Love, among others. She earned her BA in Studio Art and Media Studies from UVA and her MFA in Film and Video from CalArts. Welcome, Vashti. Joining us also is Dub Leffler, author of Once There Was a Boy. He is an Australian illustrator, writer, animator, and mixed media artist working in books, film, television, muralism, and art education. He has taught and workshopped illustration in Australia, Scotland, Indonesia, and the United States. He lives with his daughter and family of chickens on the central coast of New South Wales. And our moderator, Mac McClellan, is a Baltimore native who moved to Charlottesville in 2016. In an effort to decrease the academic achievement gap, he created Simunye, which is Zulu for We Are One, a nonprofit organization that facilitates a series of culturally competent programs geared towards academic achievement and success. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Mac, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, first and foremost, I want everybody to know that my heart is pounding because I am on this call with Angela Dominguez, Vashti Harrison and Dub Leffler. So my heart is pounding, please bear with me uh, because I, I'm, I'm in fan mode right now. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to speak with you all. And um, before we get started with any questions, is there anything that you all would like to share um, about anything upcoming that you're doing? Anything new, anything that we can see on the horizons? Hint, hint, you know, Spoiler alerts. I have one new picture book that's coming out later this year. Okay. Um, we just released the cover of that and it's Hello Star um, written by Stephanie Lucianovich. Um, and I'm working on a lot of things that I can't tell you about yet. Okay, that's fine. Anyone else? Uh, well, I'm working on the fourth Stella Diaz book that will be coming out in March of next year. And that's Very called nice. Stella Diaz to the Rescue. And then I'm working on a couple other picture books as well. Awesome. Dub, anything? Uh, okay. I'm actually retiring. I'm not doing any children's books. No. I'm, I'm done with this industry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I have, I have a few books coming out. Um, uh, Once It Was a Girl, the follow-up to Once It Was a Boy. Okay. Um, and uh, I've got about six in the works as well as a, a few other um, projects. So. Mm, okay. Mm. So, as a lover of children's literature, um, one of the things that I do is I, I look at diversity in literature. And in 2019, they did a survey of 3,716 books. And of those 3,716 books, 11% or 11.9, so we'll say 12% um, had African American or black uh, main characters. 1% had First Nation or Native Americans. 8.7% had Asian Americans. 5.3% had Latinos or Latinx. 0.05% um, Pacific Islanders. 41.8% white. 29.2% animal. Um, when you hear those numbers, uh, 
it's kind of daunting in children's literature. And, you know, the, the biggest numbers are white characters at 41.8% and then animals. So my first question is, um, and I'm going to start with Angela because I see you in the top. Uh, what made you write about a person and then why did you choose a person of color? Well, I think when I went into children's books, I just wanted to draw things that were cute and I love to draw. Um, but as I worked and started illustrating people's books and started writing my own, I started going to schools and I started seeing kids that look like me and had my experiences. And when I started having characters that were Latino or their books in Spanish, their eyes would light up because they realized that they could connect with me and my work. And so that's been a driving force for me for a while now, because it's just the idea that they can see themselves in the book. And not only that, I think it opens the eyes to other kids, other teachers, parents of other kids' situations as well. You know, because I'm a first generation immigrant to the United States, and I didn't realize how much it impacted me until I got older. And so to let kids know that um, it's okay to be Latinx, to speak another language, to be an immigrant, I think is just really an important and powerful message because I don't want there to be any shame or any um, nervousness or timidness about having any of those things. Awesome. Vashti, please, same question. What made you write about uh, a person or people uh, and then people of color? Well, my intro into making books for kids came through illustration. Drawing was something I did a lot as a kid. I stopped for a while and I picked it up later in life and then became a children's book illustrator. But it, uh, returning to it as an adult helped me kind of zero in on some of the major influences throughout my childhood. I used to do a lot of copying. I would sit in front of the TV and copy my favorite characters. I would flip through magazines and draw makeup ads and eyelashes and all that stuff. And I would watch movies. And I realized that so many of my influences and so many of the artists that I admired were all creating a very homogenous style of artwork. Um, and it had bled into my own artwork and the way that I viewed people. Um, I will say I draw people a lot. I'm not the best at animals. So I will always be drawn to people, but I realized that a lot of the eye shapes and the body shapes and the body colors and the type, type of hair that I was drawing was all influenced by a very homogenous source of, of inspiration. And that's white American culture. And, um, you know, I, I don't blame my childhood self for for falling in love with the way that Ariel's hair flowed around because it was animated beautifully. But as an adult and as someone who was returning to drawing, um, you know, after having gone through undergrad and gone through grad school, I realized that I wanted to imbue my artwork with a lot of the stuff that I was missing, what I didn't grow up with. Um, I didn't see books. I didn't see any characters and picture books that looked like me. I didn't have a ton of books at home. My most, the, the place I interacted with them the most was school and the library and the books that my little library had were very, very few. Um, and so what I knew that I wanted to do when I realized what I was making were children's illustrations was um, create mirrors and reflections of those little Vashtis who probably could have used um, some magical black girl characters and um, learn to love the color of their skin and learn to love the way their hair like curls and coils. So a lot of that influence came from, um, you know, reflecting on, on what I was missing and what I wanted for other young people growing up in America. Uh -huh. I love it. I love it. Dub, you're a little bit different. You are from Australia originally. And so you're not in, it's a little bit different there. You're not white. Um, you are still a person of color, but I don't know, do you all even say person of color or how, how do you reference that? And then tell us about um, your experiences and what made you 
uh, draw people in people of color? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, it is different here. Uh, uh, it's it's either like um, like with Aboriginal people, it's you're either Aboriginal or you're not. It's like a it's it's a cultural thing, <clears throat> and so you always um, and you get claimed by you know, especially me, um, being quite fair, you get um, pulled in both directions, and so um, it, like both camps. They'll sort of say, no, he's, he's white, he's, or he's black. Uh, and it just depends on which community uh, that I'm in. But, it, it's, it, but it's also those highlights, like uh, those differences are highlighted. Um, if I'm um, with, a, with a group of Aboriginal people, then um, my, my whiteness is highlighted and vice versa. Um, as a, uh, now, we were talking about books. Um, oh, I just want to say hello to everybody that's watching. That's really cool. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, you, you would say, like for me when I was growing up and, um, and, and I was, um, you know, collecting lots of um, encyclopedias and, and, and often those encyclopedias were American. And I still have them. And... Um, you know, and I was always looking for um, Aboriginal content when I was little because you want to see yourself reflected in books. Uh, I don't know who, who said it, um, you know, you can't be what you can't see. So it's, and, it, and here in Australia, is a, there is a lack of, um, uh, of Aboriginal role models. And, you know, at, outside of sport, I think, um, you know, I mean, there's, there is a few of us um, which are making headway, but you, you ultimately you want to, you, it's, you know, it's not about climbing ladders, it's about building them for other people. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of part of the impetus of um, making sure that there's um, the characters that are drawn in books, they're not, um, they're not white, you know, and because um, you just want to show, you know, like it's Australia is a, very mixed multicultural country mm -hmm. and um it should be yeah it's i mean i think the stats are probably really similar um where you know between the states and 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 here uh, when it comes to representation so that's sort of like and i and i uh tend not to make it too specific i just put someone brown in there um and sort of don't um, you know, harp on the features too much. So, you know, ultimately you want a bigger crowd to relate. And so I just sort of create these characters that are a middle ground. So a lot of people from different places, hopefully they can connect. Um, that way it just sort of makes it a universal um, sort of thing. Mm. I love that. And, and I think that is important because, okay, I'm going to be honest with, with you. I've read Once There Was a Boy. And I'm one, I think all three of you are so talented in the fact that we say children's books, right? But when I read your books, I'm captivated as an adult. I'm, I'm really into the books. I found myself reading um, all of your books at different times. And I'm sitting there and I'm just reading, I'm reading. Something happens and I look up and I'm like, all right, do I address this person who's talking to me or do I go back to the book because I'm really enjoying what I'm doing I do hear this person talking so you all are just like pulling people in with your books and that must was a boy kind of hit me real hard in the heart and you all are so talented where did you find your inspiration to write um there once was a boy uh I it's, well, it, it was, it took me five years like from concept to cover, uh, you know, but the, the main inspiration is kids when I mean, you're teaching kids. And I would do um, uh, you know, market research. So you'd ask, you know, I was writing a story at the time and, and when there was free time at the end of a lesson, I would um, say, you want to hear a story that has um, never been told. And so their ears would prick up, you know, they would, um, and 
in a, and I would leave because it was incomplete. Um, and so I would ask the kids, what do you think happens next? You know, because you want to see where their, their mind is going and what, you know, what opportunities that they want to create. And so, you know, I owe them some royalties because a lot of kids would say, oh, let's do that. Why, why don't you put this in the book? This would be so cool, you know. Um, so that was, uh, you know, like I was, you know, I, I would tell like friends and family that story long before it was published. And I, I was just illustrating. Um, I'd illustrated a few books at that point, but I had never written and then, and, and that book actually, that changed my life. That was the, um, you know, that got me over to the States and, and um, it allowed me to travel um, that book. So, and I think, you know, that sort of, it goes from that, um, you know, it, it's like a relatable, relatable story that sort of everybody can, it just, it's not just about one group, you know. Um, it's, uh, so yeah, that really like it was such a. It's a yeah, it's a really it's a it's glad I'm glad that it's hit, like it it's hit you that's affected affected you Mac because you know like as as men we often don't talk about our feelings, um, especially with, with boys. You know we just uh, we just run along or bump into things and um, we sort of bottle up stuff. So and you know that was sort of one of the main. Um, re reasons behind the book was that you know I want kids I want boys to be able to communicate better um, you know just you know in a sense be more like women so we can um, yeah. you know there, we, there would be less problems I think in the world well said because let me tell you I was blessed with amazing women in my life so I was allowed to cry and uh, it made life a lot easier and it made life a lot easier being to express my feelings. Um, Vashti, you are like the children book historian. And, you know, I, I read your books because I want to know about some of these people. I'm like, I never knew this. And how, how did that come about? What, what drew you to that? That is very generous of you to say. I by no means consider myself a historian or a biographer. I just really like telling stories. Um, and I was inspired to tell the stories with my first book, Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History, um, because I was teaching my own self about Black History Month. It was this month, uh, four years ago, I just started a challenge for myself to do something different for Black History Month. I looked into the history and I was reading about how Carter G. Woodson founded Negro History Week mm -hmm. in 1926 and how he wanted to celebrate the stories that have been long neglected throughout history. And I thought, okay, that's great. I'm going to do that. Um, I would like to celebrate the stories of black women whose stories have been doubly neglected throughout history. So I was really just challenging myself to learn about folks that I didn't know so much about. I was thinking about how during my childhood, I kind of heard the same stories kind of repeated over and over again. So I wanted to investigate and teach myself something new. And fortunately I had the chance to turn it into a book and it became a book series. And so I really tried to take that, um, that sentiment throughout all of the books and, and focus on some names that may be new or unfamiliar or kind of some hidden figures to kind of spark some creativity or interest in a kid's mind. I feel like um, what I'm interested in is uh, telling interesting stories and sharing them with young people in engaging ways. As a kid, I did not enjoy history. Um, I did like stories and I liked beautiful pictures. And so I thought, you know, when I had the opportunity to make something for kids, they're so you know, they don't lie. They tell you when they don't like something. And, and that's why I think kids' books are so engaging to read, Mac. I agree with you. I get really hooked into kids' books because you have to put in as much as you can to make sure that kid wants to turn the page and is engaged and interested in these characters. You can't, you know, 
do it halfway because they will tell you if they don't yes. like something. Um, so that's what I was really focused on was making sure that I was making something that they would be interested in that they could flip through any one of these pages and think that character is so cute. These college colors are so pretty. I want to read about that person. And very important for me because I had uh, this happen in my childhood a lot. Me and my cousin would watch TV and she would always say, that one's me. And there would always be like a lame character. She would choose the cool character and, she, and I would always have to be the lame character. And I said, if I ever make a book, I'm going to make sure everyone's cool and I'm going to make sure they all look the same <laughs> yeah. so that you can always be the cool, exciting character. There's no reason to feel like this one's not as interesting as that one. This one doesn't have a cool outfit. This one's not as pretty. <laughs> I mean, I what I really want is to be able to share these wonderful stories with kids because who knows what it's gonna what it, what's gonna spark inside of them? So, um, you know, the the most important part in turning these collections of biographies into books um, for me was making sure that I had this very diverse list of names in regards to what they did and where they came from, specifically in the second book. But in the first book, what I thought was, you know, what if this is someone's first introduction to black history. So I wanna make sure there are some really big names, some of those kind of hidden figures, but I also wanna make sure it's not just filled with the stories of doctors and lawyers, but we also have astronauts and poets and sculptors and people who do all types of things because I think that, you know, I would wanna make sure there was something for everyone because there's that intense question that so many adults ask kids all the time. And I didn't love this question. It's what do you want to be when you grow up? Now, I don't feel like anyone needs to know that too soon, but I want to kind of arm kids with the knowledge of all these different possibilities that exist for them. And so that's why I think I got really interested in telling these histories um, because I felt like, wow, if I had known about all of these people when I was in in, in college, in high school, let alone middle school or elementary school, maybe I would have spent a little less time questioning myself. Maybe I would have felt more confident in following art, or maybe I would have picked up a camera sooner and gotten excited about photography when I was really little. So um, that's why I think these histories are so exciting and wonderful is because they're, they're literally just the stories of people. And that's what we tell every single day. Man, you would have thought I gave you like the whole thing beforehand to <laughs> read and so well said. I love it. <laughs> Angela, please tell me about Stella. Who is Stella? Because I feel like Stella is somebody that we know. <laughs> so that's accurate. Um, Stella started as a design, like a character design I did of a curly, curly haired girl who wore polka dots and I just had an idea of wouldn't it be fun to do a story at an aquarium and I wrote it as a picture book worked on it for a year and then it just didn't work because it wasn't really clear why she was so shy and she's having problems talking to a boy at school and that's not clear in the picture book either so I kind of started thinking okay what if I start writing this book as a longer story like Ramona, like Beverly Cleary, like Alvin Ho, these books that I really adore. And I started realizing the reason I was shy growing up was language because I had to take speech classes until third grade and I struggled with like switching my English and Spanish a little bit. And I started just writing the story and it kept growing and growing and it took me three years to do. And I found an editor that uh, was really motivated and um, really excited by the story and you know we made it happen and it had such a positive response that I was able to do more Stella's and I've absolutely loved writing them I feel like I actually know what I'm doing now by the third book because writing them are so much longer than writing picture books and as I've written these stories um, things that interest me now and that I think are also important to kids has influenced the writing, like, you know, taking care of the oceans and being advocates for the environment. 
And then with the third book, she was being overscheduled, which is something that I think we all can relate to, but especially kids too, who feel like sometimes they're afraid to even speak up that they like something because then their parents sign them up for a class or an activity. So letting kids know that it's okay to feel like that and how to handle it. So it definitely started with me, but it's become her own little character with, uh, I guess, a lot of me still in there. Okay. And so are you uh, big into the ocean? Because Stella has, Stella's got a thing with the ocean. You know, <laughs> is so that you? I, that is kind of me okay. uh, as an adult, uh, not okay. as a kid. I liked it as a child, but I think I was so obsessed with drawing and movies that I didn't even pay attention to that kind of stuff. But now um, I just love the environment. It's somewhere that I go to get inspiration and ideas and just watching documentaries, you realize what problems they're facing. And also like you see amazing kids like uh, Greta Thunberg and mm -hmm. you see how important it is to them. And I also want kids to feel like they can speak up about things that they're really important to them and feel inspired to do the same. Nice, nice. So one thing that I've realized with all of your writings is that you all make it multicultural. There's no just one um, race. Uh, Stella has a Vietnamese friend and you talk about uh, the food, the, the type of Vietnamese pancakes that her family makes. Um, I learned a lot about Chinese, Polish, uh, French, Black, African women in uh, Think Big Little One. And, and I'm, I'm trying to tell you, Vash, you're a historian. I know you don't say it, but I'm sitting there. You have dates and everything when they are alive and all those things. And it, Dub, and then I, I read Dub, you have different characters. It's, you know, you talk about the ancient tree, but the little boy on that island, when that girl comes, she's got blonde hair, right? So she's different. And, and it might not be a huge difference you know, it's not that she doesn't necessarily come from there, but there is a difference. So Vashti, I'll start with you. What drew you to not just telling, because it's easy to say, well, I'm black, so I'm going to just tell black stories. Or, you know, I am uh, Aboriginal, so I'm just going to tell Aboriginal stories. I am Latinx, I'm only going to tell Latinx stories. You all don't do that. Vashti, why? Well, the the inspiration I had for for all of these books was sort of creating that reflection. You know how Dr. Redeen Sims Bishop talks about how children's books act as windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. And so, sure, my first book was very much a mirror um, in reflecting the types of stories that would have been really helpful for me as a young black girl. But the other mirror that I also really needed as a kid was other creative stories as an artist. And I'm sure Angela and Deb can talk to this as well. Um, inspiration literally comes from anywhere. And, and that, you know, the fact that we can all create will connect us. And so you know, the second book that I wrote, Visionary, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World, is about women artists and scientists. And I, as much as like, you know, I don't look like some of the women in this book, I see that reflection of myself. I see that curious little kid. I see that person who's asking the questions and maybe folks aren't exactly listening or thinking that you're a little too crazy, you've got wild ideas. But do you know how many kids are like that? They need those reflections. They need to know exactly. So I want, you know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I could collect all of these stories in a way that made sure um, we could see how all of these different stories can come together to create this interesting tapestry of the world of creative thinkers, people who push themselves to ask the questions no one else is asking. And I think that that sentiment could be true for any book. But what I wanted to make sure was that I showed someone, um, you know, even if it's, you know, a little Vashti, that she could see, you know, folks from all over the world who are feeling very similar to the way that she was feeling, like, maybe a little bit alone, maybe a little bit shy, but curious about 
the world. So, um, you know, when you can, you know, find that reflection of yourself in, in stories of folks from all around the world and people who don't necessarily look like you, you can find that connection. And, and, you know, a lot of the book was inspired by Ada Lovelace who thought, um, she really wanted to bring together art and science. And she really thought if you can, um, you know, consider a question, consider an idea from those two sp- perspectives, you can really tr- fully understand an idea. So when you have those multiple and diverse perspectives in your own mind, you can approach things in a more, um, you know, creative and an interesting way. And so that's what I want for young readers. That's what I want for young people growing up in America to know that, you know, these, these opinions and these ideas from all around the world are going to be helpful in, in creating and finding these incredible discoveries. Wow. Angela, the diversity in your books, you know, talk to us about that. Well, partially it was inspired by my upbringing because my best friend growing up was Vietnamese. Okay. And so I wanted to reflect my own experience, but part of the reason that we were so close is that we were both used to going at home was completely different from school and we could switch back and forth between different languages. And we just really bonded in that way of how similar yet we're completely different cultures. And then also just the idea of, again, reflecting reality, you know, many of our schools are diverse and trying to convey that just makes it a little bit more realistic. I also want to show diversity, though, within the Latinx culture in general, because I think, um, you know, there's that terminology that it's not a monolith. And so there are so many different Latinx countries and so many little differences that matter. Like for instance, in the first Stella, I mentioned a quesadilla, which in Mexico is yeah. wonderful, cheesy. And then you have the Salvadorian yeah. quesadilla. Yes, which is a sweet pastry. And I remember when I was little, when I heard about that, it blew my mind because I was just like, how can this be one thing, but then another thing? And the more that you study Spanish, you just learn how many different words there are in different countries. And I just think all of that is so beautiful. And I want people to realize these differences and see how interesting it is and how diverse it is too. So are, do you have a Salvadorian and Mexican uh grandparents I do okay because so Stella is you like to a T (laughs) it's a lot there's differences it's okay I I, you know as I'm reading the book and I'm sitting there I'm like I wonder if this is Angela who calls herself Stella which is fine but (laughs) I I love it and so Doug uh there once was a boy tell us about the diversity that you put in there because you have two characters and you still made it diverse. It's, uh, mm, it's, well, I mean, it, it was, you know, it was written um, on two levels, you know, mm-hmm. you, you've got the, you've got adults in mind and you've also got kids and it's, uh, you, you know, like they, you know, like, you know, you're not born racist, you know, like you learn those behaviors. So, you know, kids will, when they talk about other kids um, from other backgrounds, they might, they'll, they might may tell you the facts. Um, you know, yeah, like she's got black skin, dad, you know, um, she's got this and that, and that's, it stops there, you know, it doesn't inform their decisions. They just describe people. And, and you know, whereas adults, there's all, you know, we've got all this other baggage, all this other stuff. Um, and even when you're reading a book, you end up bringing that, that, that there. And, and um, I think, you know, just like it's a, it's summing up, um, you know, colonization, the invasion of Australia, uh, but just in a subtle way, you know, I'm not bashing over, bashing anyone over the head, um, saying, you know, look, this, like, cause everybody, like I'm giving the, the, um, the reader, uh, uh, what's the word? You know, like I'm, I'm giving them respect um, because they 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 have those answers there, and they'll they will also get out, you know, get stuff out of the book. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, well, this is this is what's happened because everybody knows what's happened, um, 
It's just um, what happens after. And so just having those two characters there and, and I'm not saying where they're from, like, you know, like he's on an island. It could, it could be Australia. It could be, um, you know, the Maldives or, you know, it could be anywhere. Um, and, and the same with her, like she just appears, she's just there, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's more to do with their actions, not, um, not what they look like or, you know, where they're from. And uh, so there's like a little, you know, hidden message there. There's, um, I, I ran into a lady um, who was at my, um, my uh, daughter's play group a few years ago. And she um, said she was working on Manus Island. You might've heard of Manus Island, mm -hmm. the coast of Australia with all, you know, where they're um, dumping all these people um refugees and um they've actually she was telling me she said i i was teaching on that island and i was teaching them your book and um and they were they could see because there's that there's a boat in the book and um so they could see a part of themselves and so the book took another life you know there's a, there is um a refugee aspect as well you know and it's not and it's not written about in the book it's just something there um so it's sort of you know it's it's good because it hits um you know more more groups um respond to the book uh, which is ultimately what you want you know you 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 want your story to um to spread i was just thinking when um you're talking before vashti uh, but you know like we we there's a bit of a responsibility like do you guys see that there's you know doing um i mean just kids books in general but there's also when we you know when we do um books about history you know we are we're sort of almost like literary politicians in a way because we're we're handling um some you know subjects that have actually actually happened um I mean, it's the same thing that what uh, politicians do and they also, you know, they lay out a path for the future and that's sort of, that's what we do, you know. We, so we, you, you, your kids can aspire to this, you can aspire to that, you know, like we, we um, give everybody options. Uh, what yeah, do you guys for think? sure. Yeah, so, I agree. I, I think it's like, it's inherently political to tell, to choose certain stories to tell. So a lot of what's been big in the news and in, I don't know, probably in the past 10, 15 years or so is really kind of investigating who gets to tell which stories, who gets to choose what's in our history books. And so inherently embedded in the choice of making a book about women in history is is inherently political is to suggest that this story isn't hasn't been told so it's um you know it's a it's a response to the way that we tell people or tell children what is important um and so it has to be included it's part of it um but i think like at the end of the day it's there to what i'm what i'm hoping to create is not a textbook. It's a book that any kid will look at and think, oh, I want to take a look at that. I want to look at these pictures. It's there to supplement their education or to just be something for them to have fun and engage with. Um, and what I hope is that it does function on all of those levels that I mentioned before. Sure, it's a, it's a mirror for the people who need it, but it's also a window for other people to look into a world that is not their own and learn about it. And then hopefully it functions like a sliding glass door and they'll step into someone else's experience and understand it. And so, um, you know, some folks will write to me and say, oh, I know that you come from this political background because I can tell by the way you chose the people that went into your book. And it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a human. And, and it's not a, you know, it's not exactly a science, you know, I'm trying to create a book that reflects these different, uh, perspectives and aspects of the world and and sure you know I have things that I value and things that I hope that kids will enjoy but you know I'm not I'm not trying to indoctrinate anyone but I you know it's, it's impossible to take that out of it so it's 
you know, it's part, it's part of the, what we do as creators. What's so interesting to me is that I don't even see it as political. You, you all have done this so seamlessly by um, writing these stories where you just make everybody human, right? And you talk about the differences in our humanities, but it's never, it doesn't feel political to me. It, it's actually your, your work just, it feels like you're just addressing uh, so many people that we don't know. And you're just like, hey, here are people that you don't know in history. You know, the, I mean, if you wrote about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, and you stop there, it'd be like, oh, this is another same old, same old book. But you expand and you go so far. And, and again, like you said, you have created a sliding glass door. You're creating different perspectives. So it's, it just doesn't feel political. Um, Angela, I love how you just talk about these different people. And, and I love how you throw some Spanish in there. So, you know, when Stella's, you know, nervous, her cheeks get roja, you know, and, and I like how her mother speaks in Spanish to her, but you also follow up with basically the English translation without it being the English translation, you know, and I think that you do that so well. And so it doesn't make me feel, I mean, I just, and maybe it's just me. I just feel like I'm reading these books and I'm getting to know these characters. And I'm getting to know these people as people and seeing some of the things that they do. Uh, the little boy and Dub, that picture of that boat was, matter of fact, let's switch gears because the picture of that boat was amazing. You all seamlessly write about people. You all do such a great job telling stories. But the one thing that you all do that I really want to touch on is the art. You all are amazing artists and it makes the story come to life in a different way. And talk to me, um, Dub, I'm gonna start with you this time. What prompted you to do art? And what started first? And you all can think about this, um, Angela and Vashti. Was it the art or the stories first? Yeah, I, um, oh, well, it's, if you're following a, a you know, a really old tradition of, um, you know, like when, when we were carving in, in stone and painting uh, on cave walls, you know, we we're still telling stories. We we're using pictures to tell stories. And, uh, you know, like uh, uh, every written language um, has its roots in illustration. Um, you know, people often talk about, uh, like you guys know about the, the letter A, you know, about the history of the letter A. Do you know that? No. Um, I'll just, I've got a book here. I'll just show you. So, <laughs> so we know that like um, the letter A, English letter A, and it's, um, so the capital is like this, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't always look like that. And this is what I teach kids. Um, it was, um, it actually looked like, it looked like this uh, originally. And, uh, and so you show, you know, you sh uh, it was the Phoenicians that, that invented it, but they didn't call it A, they called it Aleph. And if you listen to the word alphabet, it's in alphabet. And the second letter was Beth. So Aleph Beth became alphabet. And Aleph, it means ox. So if you look carefully, you can see that it's the, the head of the ox and there's the two horns, you see? Actually, so like yes. all our, um, so we just, like I, I'm always conscious of that, that we've always been telling stories with pictures. And, and, you know, people just think that words and illustration are from two different places, but they come from the same point. Um, and so that, that really sort of, um, especially with, you know, like kids that their literacy levels uh, are quite low, uh, you know, especially here in Aboriginal communities. Um, but everyone understands pictures. And it's, it's true that saying, you know, a picture is worth a thousand, thousand words. Um, 
so like it you know i've always been drawing ever since i was in um you know infant school we call it or you know preschool and primary school and and then every now and then i would describe a picture or i would write um something about something you know and like what like once once it was a boy for instance was it was just started with a charcoal sketch of this tiny little hut on a beach it was really messy that drawing i've still got it somewhere and um yeah, I started wondering who lives in that hut on the beach, and so you start, you know, you start writing that stuff. But yeah, I've been doing. Um, I think like everyone, you know, naturally we can do that. We we do draw when we're kids, and it's uh, but it's it's not like riding a bike. You know, we do forget, and we have to keep drawing. Like that's why they call it art practice. I tell kids, you know, that's not about, that's not talent. It's practice. You know, we have to practice to, um, to, to become proficient at anything. And, um, you know, so every illustration is practice for the next one. So it's, I think it's just you know, something that's always been in us. And I'm, yeah, I'm interested to hear um, from um, Angela and, and Vashti about you guys. No, Angela, please jump in because yours is a little bit different. You don't have full, Stella Diaz is not full on pictures, but you do draw, but then you have other art as well. Yep. So I started with illustration. Uh, I've always loved to draw. It was a way that I expressed myself. I took every single art class I could in high school and went to art college uh, to study illustration. And I started illustrating other people's stories and I kind of got this craving to start telling my own stories. Um, I just wanted to do the whole thing, not just the pictures, the words too. And my agent really encouraged me to try writing. So it was, it took me a little bit because like I did well in school, but just the fact that um, I have like mild dyslexia and just like the language thing a little bit, I was a little intimidated with the idea of writing. But as I've written more, I just absolutely love it. And I just feel like I almost love it as much as the illustration. It's hard to say, because when I'm writing a lot, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. But as soon as I start working on a picture book, it's like, this is my favorite thing in the entire world. So they're really two of my like, biggest loves that I get to do often, which is great. Nice, nice. Thank you. Yeah, so I talked a little bit before. I, I always drew as a kid, but um, but I stopped for a long time. And so Dub is actually exactly right. Um, when I picked up drawing again, I was not as good as I used to be. And I very it was so clear to me, okay, if you don't practice at something, you're not gonna be very good at it. So I always tell kids, it's like if you're a really fast runner and you stop running for five, six, seven years, are you gonna be as fast as you once were? He used the comparison of riding a bike. Exactly. It's not like you could just pick right back up where you were before. It takes real work and practice. And that's what I did. I just forced myself to draw every day pretty much since then. So since about six, seven years ago, I've just been drawing every single day to try to teach myself new things and force myself to do the things I dislike or really like. Um, when it came to illustrating these books, the little leaders, little dreamers, little legends, obviously I could have illustrated these people, these famous people to look like themselves, but I, I chose to create um, a little kid character. And for me, these are little kids dressing up as these famous people. I kind of imagine that they're putting on this costume and they're kind of closing their eyes and they're imagining themselves in the worlds of these famous people. And I hope that that's what, what young readers can do when they look at these pages, imagine themselves in, in, in the shoes of these wonderful people. Um, but, you know, to kind of go back to the little, you know, the political aspect, like, one of the other things that I wanted to create with these books was to make them feel really sweet, really wonderful and innocent. I wanted it to fit like on the shelf right next to those classics, next to Winnie the Pooh and Madeline and Eloise because I never saw black girls in those books mm. or, or girls of color in those books. Um, but I also was really thinking about this study that I had read that came out of the Georgetown 
um, law center on poverty and inequality that said that young black girls are viewed as less innocent and more adult than their white counterparts, starting as young as age four. Um, it's called adultification bias. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, like, I don't have a huge platform. I don't have all these tools, but I can do something about that with my art. I can make really cute characters and make people say, oh, you know, when people look at Winnie the Pooh, they say, oh my God, he's so cute. And how can I do that with little kids of color? Can I make people have that same reaction? So, you know, as much as like, I'm thinking about those things when it goes into the work, there's a reason mm -hmm. it, it functions that way. But for the kid viewer, I just want it to be something that they enjoy, something mm -hmm. that they can follow along with me and draw and something that they can see a reflection of themselves in. So, you know, as much as like, yeah, I hope that my work doesn't come off as, you know, entirely political because I don't want to be didactic with it. But I think that everything has to have intention. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, why Very would much. I be doing it? So, yeah, I think it's operate It's hopefully it's operating on this, all of those different levels. Well, the kid reader in me sees it and sees how impactful it is to see somebody that looks like them, see somebody who might look like someone else, but not feel as though you're trying to push a narrative is you're giving this information. You're giving information that I wouldn't receive otherwise. And um, you all do such a great job of that. And I got a quick lightning round uh, that I would love to ask you all these questions. So first thing that comes to mind. All right, you all ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vashti, favorite children's book that's not your own? Uh, anything by Gyo Fujikawa. Okay. Uh, Angela, favorite author other than yourself? That's hard. Um, Lane Smith and probably Aaron Atrada Kelly. Okay. Dub, if you could collaborate with anyone in history, who would it be and why? Oh, <laughs> geez. You're giving me the easy one. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's an illustrator here called Robert Inkman. And he, uh, yeah, he's uh, amazing. He's probably one of the best in the world. He definitely, he would be the best in Australia, for sure. Yeah. All right. That, that was easy enough. Vashti, uh, who would you collaborate with ever in history and why? Mm, I would love to talk to and collaborate with Augusta Savage, who was a sculptor mm. from the Harlem Renaissance. Yes. Angela? It's always hard for me to choose one. So I would say E.B. White, because he's one of my favorite authors as well. And then, I, you know, Frida Carlo is one of those huge inspirations as a yes. kid. And I, I, I think we'd make some really fun, weird books together. <laughs> <laughs> Dub, favorite children's book, not your own? Um, uh, uh, there's one called Storm Boy. Here okay. In Australia. Yeah, yeah, which is amazing. Vashti, favorite author, not you. Oh, man. Favorite author, not me. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm kind of blanking. I'm looking at my bookshelf. Uh, oh, I'm really into Tove Janssen right now. Okay. Who wrote the Moomin books. Okay. Uh, Angela, favorite children's book, not your own. That's tricky. <laughs> um, Single favorite? That's a yeah, trick question. <laughs> um, well, I would say Ramona Quimby is probably really up there. That was a big impact on me. Okay. And Dub, have I, which one did I not ask? Oh, favorite author? Is that the one I haven't asked you, Dub? Yeah. Um, I, I like um, Junko uh, Morimoto. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think they're, they're epic stories. I just love that the epicness uh, that Janko has got in her books. Yeah. And did I, Angela, I ask you favorite book and favorite author? Yes. And Vashti, I asked you both. Okay. So mm -hmm. everybody got a chance to answer those things. Last question for everybody. We're just going to popcorn it. Whoever answers first, we'll just pass it on. 
what's on your current reading list or what are you currently reading? So you might have a list that you haven't started yet or you might be currently reading something. Oh, King of the Dragonflies by Case and Calendar. I've okay. had it for so long and I need to sit down and read it. I'm reading a collection of short stories by E.B. White. It's one that I go back to reread a few times. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm writing this book called Paramedico by a, a friend of mine, uh, Ben, that I just met on the, uh, on tour. He's a, he's a um, ambulance, he's a paramedic that works around the world. Uh, it's a collection of his stories. Really, really cool. Awesome, awesome. Well, unfortunately, it is time to wrap things up. I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking with the three of you, amazing authors and artists. Um, thank you, Angela, Vashti, and Dub. Um, thank you to everyone who is watching. Please, please, please consider buying their books. Um, you can, they're featured from your local independent bookseller. Um, you could also use the link provided at vabook.org. You can also check out other events in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. Ladies and gentlemen, it has truly been a pleasure and I hope to see you all again soon. You Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. All right. Nice to meet you, Vashti and Angela. It was nice chatting. Thanks, everyone, for watching. All right. Thank nice you all. See you guys. Bye.